Hi, it's The Wire. It is Saturday, June 22nd, 2024. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, from time to time, I make videos where I get ahead of myself and uh, make mistakes. Let me correct some mistakes that I've made in some past videos. I got a bit carried away in talking about Liam Parrow. I do believe he is very underrated, even today, now that he has a title. Right? I called him the best fighter in Australia. That was foolish of me. Let me hit my own hand here. You have two fighters in Australia who I would give the nod over him. Right? The first, the guy who I do believe is the best in Australia right now, is cruiserweight champion Jay Obataya. As I've said here more than once, Obataya should be fighting bigger heavyweights. They would not know what to do with his combination of twitchiness, the fact that he's a southpaw, the fact that he's fast-handed, the fact that he moves around the ring excellently. I think big clunky guys would fall apart in front of him. Let me make another point too, and it needs to be made. You have a situation developing at Bridgerweight that we need to keep an eye on. Lawrence Acoli, who has a share of the belt at Bridgerweight, has issued an open challenge to former heavyweight champion Deontay Wilder. Folks, that's a huge fight that would make the division. Understand, Wilder has fought most of his career at weights that would qualify for the Bridgerweight division, including his last fight against Gili Zhang. Understand, too, that Richard Reakpour, and that fight was a shocker to me. I was expecting Reakpour to win. He lost to Chris Billum Smith and afterward announced that he might be moving up to the heavyweight division. Reakpour certainly is tall enough. He certainly has the power. I've seen fighters who have been weight draining themselves for years suddenly re-energize themselves and give themselves a lot more stamina. Think Bernard Hopkins. When, later in their careers, they move up in weight. A react poor Okoli fight would be a barn burner. It would have to take place at Bridger weight. Right? So, just food for thought. The other Australian fighter who I would certainly give the nod to over Liam Paro. And let's remember, Paro is 28. They call him the prodigy. He's actually a little bit too old to be a prodigy. But understand, Tim Zhu, at this stage, has done more in his pro career than Paro. Understand, too, that Sebastian Fundora fight is really tainted by the cut. That's a cut fight. If Tim Zhu doesn't suffer a cut that's bleeding, that's a problem... Who knows what would have happened in that fight? That's Tim Zhu's only loss. I would say that Australia's two best fighters are Tim Zhu and Jay Opataya. Right? I'm going to correct myself. I'm going to censor myself uh, here and just point out that I made a mistake in the earlier video. Uh, hopefully, I've acknowledged that here. I also made a mistake concerning Gervonta Davis. You know, I pointed out that Gervonta Davis is the Godzilla at 135. He is, right? Um, I believe he beats Lomachenko, right? I would need significant odds to take either Lomachenko or Shakur Stevenson over him. And, you know, those guys really are the best boxers at 135. Understand, though, boxing also involves punching power. You can be the better craftsman, the better technician, and still not be the better fighter if you don't have the punch to keep the puncher off of you. Right? So, I personally would need a plus 150 
to take a Loma or to take a Shakur Stevenson over a Gravante Davis. But there is a guy, <clears throat> and he's at 140 now. There is a guy who I believe is Stevenson's best opponent. He's already proven it. Their first fight was a possession fight. By that I mean Stevenson was the one, excuse me, um, Gervonta Davis was the one who everyone knew going into the fight. Gervonta Davis was the favorite. Gervonta Davis was the person getting the benefit of the doubt. Understand, I personally believe life's unfair. I don't believe boxing's a meritocracy. I believe fans fall in love with fighters. I believe judges fall in love with fighters. I believe there's pressure on judges to follow the crowd. And so I believe that the first time Gervonta Davis fought Isaac Pitbull Cruz, it was an unlevel playing field. Please revisit that film. Davis had problems with Cruz. Cruz is often behind Gervonta Davis in that fight, right? Moving around the ring, Cruz is an advanced fighter. Davis is a guy who's looking to counter you, right? Davis can lead, but Davis's real bread and butter is to figure out your punch pattern and to prepare himself to land big time counters. The problem here is you have boxing's equivalent of a basketball no-look pass in Isaac Cruz. Cruz not only is throwing punches at odd angles, but Cruz is advanced to the point where he's looking away as he's throwing the punch at an odd angle. In other words, this is the guy who does not admire his own work. You cannot tell where he's throwing punches by looking at his eyes. Watch Davis's face. Davis is looking at another fighter's eyes. He's trying to figure out what the guy's going to do next. Look at the end of the Frank Martin fight. Davis has that double left prepared. Right? He's figured out after a slow start that has him losing the fight. He's figured out Frank Martin's pattern, right? Martin doesn't hit as hard as Pitbull Cruz. Davis is just laying in the weeds, ready to throw the uppercut and the hook that end the fight. Now that's harder against Pitbull because we don't realize that Pitbull actually moves around you. Right? This is the circular. And, of course, Pitbull isn't afraid of Gervonta Davis. That's very important. Right? I believe Pitbull came to win that first fight, unlike many Davis opponents who are fearful of him, who, the first time they feel the power, they want to back away. They want to get out the ring. Pitbull felt Davis's power and thought, okay, he hits like me. Right? Pitbull believes, in my opinion, that he's not only better than Davis, but that he's better than everyone else. This is the fighter who believes in himself. I wouldn't need a plus 150 to take Pitbull over Davis. Give me a plus 120 and I'll be your Huckleberry. I don't expect Davis to fight Pitbull because, let's face it, Pitbull now is at 140. Right? Let me make another point too, and this is a shocker. I don't believe Davis thinks he's not at risk against Raleigh Romero. What I want people to do, and I'm not saying Romero is, <clears throat> you know, the best fighter I've seen. People here know, I feel Ishmael Barrazzo got robbed when he fought Raleigh Romero. I picked Pitbull over Raleigh Romero. Right? But understand, the Davis 
alpha persona faded against Romero. Just look at the copy box numbers. Look at how low Davis's volume was. Davis understands that Romero has a punch. Say what you want about Raleigh Romero. He's not afraid of Davis. Don't let knockouts cause amnesia. Davis certainly won the fight. He won it by stoppage. I'm not saying Romero beat him when they fought. What I am saying, though, is Devontae Davis understands he can't open up against Raleigh Romero. Right? That's a fight where the likeliest outcome is a stoppage by either fighter. And that's a fight where the public might think that Romero doesn't belong in the ring with Davis. I'm telling you they would give you better than a plus 150 on that fight. And if they hit that plus 150 number, then I'm going to have to dance with Romero in that fight, hedging it with Davis by stoppage. Let's talk about some other things related to boxing. Ryan Garcia's suspension. Folks, that's a joke that can only happen in boxing. Right? It's a joke. He gets to keep his pay-per-view money. <clears throat> I understand to the public. They hear that he has to give back his guaranteed purse, which is more than a million dollars. Right? And they say, oh, he really got hit on the hands. <clears throat> Folks, a violation like this, where you're using a designer illegal PED like Ostrin, is really existential to your career. Other than going in the ring with loaded gloves like Antonio Margarito did for his fight, and it was a big fight against Shane Mosley and who knows how many other fights. Right? Understand, before that fight took place, Miguel Cotto felt that Margarito had cheated in his fight. Other than entering the ring with loaded gloves, or entering the ring with, you know, a gun or a knife, taking a designer PED like Osterin is about the biggest infraction you can do in a fight that you're trying to win. So let me make the point here. Ryan Garcia profited handsomely from cheating. He got a huge pay-per-view bonanza. He got his name in the paper he has boxing fans thinking that he's on par, in fact, that he can beat Devin Haney. Right, just understand, he made a mint, even giving back the base purse. Let's also remember, too, gambling is not a land for Boy Scouts. Sportsbooks fully understand at least some of them do, the smart ones, that they need to pay out on the Ryan Garcia side of the play in fights like this. I can't visit Vegas, make a bet on a fight, have the guy I bet on score multiple knockdowns in the fight, be announced the winner, collect money after the fight, leave town, go back to where I live, and then have the casino call me up. Right? We'll pretend the casino knows who I am. In most cases, they wouldn't. I'd be an anonymous gambler. Right? You're going to leave the casino where you've placed a bet and they say, can we have your name and information? You know, unless you're a whale, unless you're bidding so much, gambling so much, that you face tax liability and the casino has to give you a tax form. Unless you're in that range, the casino that starts asking for your private information, you're going to say, nah, hey, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. 
I think I stepped in the wrong place here. And you're going to be down the street at other casinos where you're just an anonymous gambler. The casinos know this. The casinos know they can't call up the whales who won on this fight and say, player, you need to give us the money back. You followed the news. Ryan Garcia is now suspended. Read our bylaws, which you can imagine is finer print than this. Right? Read our... Oh, looks like that background's working here. Read our bylaws, which say that where a fighter gets suspended and the bet's been reversed, you have to pay the money back. Folks, casinos that harass their customer base don't stay in business long. So understand, many casinos are going to just let the payout stand. Ryan Garcia juiced the money he made on the fight by pretending to be completely crazy before the fight, then betting money on himself. Right now that the bet's been reversed, I doubt that the casino where he bet is going to say, hey, well-known boxer, Garcia, life's unfair, is one of the most popular boxers out there, folks. He is. This is a guy who gets pay-per-view crowds. You really think a casino is going to decide to be on the wrong side of Ryan Garcia by calling him up and by saying, hey, you know, player, you need to give us the money back? No, the casino is going to consider that payout advertising. Right? Let me point out, too, there were a lot of people. Garcia was the underdog in this fight. There were a lot of people who bet on Devin Haney. The casino has already made money on the Haney side of the play, haven't they? Right? They cashed those checks. They filled their coffers with money from gamblers who bet on Devin Haney. The casino's not going to call you up and say, you know, we're going to give you the money back. At least not the casinos you have to visit. Right? So, let me just say, Ryan Garcia made a bonanza, understand too, his purse. The one that he has to return. The outfit that's getting it is his promoter. Bernard Hopkins, Oscar De La Hoya, Golden Boy. They're the ones getting that money. Now, you're kidding yourself. <laughs> I mean, you're kidding yourself. If you don't think Golden Boy, which has made millions of dollars off Ryan Garcia, understand the way it works. You're making a lot of money off this individual fighter. Then you have a lot of other young fighters who are Ryan Garcia fans. They study Ryan Garcia. If Golden Boy tries to recruit them, they're going to say, oh, that's right. You guys are the guys who are backing Ryan Garcia, who, of course, everyone knows has already made a bonanza off boxing. So young guys who are looking for a bonanza themselves are going to sign with Golden Boy. As macabre as this sounds, Ryan Garcia is excellent advertising for Golden Boy. So understand, the New York Boxing Commission now has given Golden Boy the right to take Brian Garcia's purse. You don't think in future negotiations Golden Boy isn't going to offer Garcia that purse back in some form? They can call it an advance. They can call it a signing bonus. You don't think Ryan Garcia is going to have access to that money? Let's say Golden Boy tries to sign Garcia to an even longer contract. And why wouldn't you? Garcia's last fight, he knocks down an unbeaten champ twice. Whatever you think about Ryan Garcia, understand that left hook has power. Well, you know the way it's going to be. If Eddie Hearn then wants to sign Ryan Garcia, wants to enter the Ryan Garcia sweepstakes, because whether he's a Boy Scout or not, he's a boxing draw. Right? If Eddie Hearn or any other promoter wants to 
try to lure Ryan Garcia. You know, Garcia is going to say, hey, you know, I've been offered a $1 million signing bonus by Golden Boy. Are you going to match that? Right? You're kidding yourself if you don't think Garcia has the market power to try to get back that more than $1 million base purse that got taken from him in a fight where, of course, he cleared millions more in pay-per-view numbers and, of course, in his own gambling. So now, Devin Haney's outraged, and he should be, especially since he has a tough fight that top rank has bid on against Sander Martin. Now, let me just say this as an aside. You know I like to hedge in bets. You know I like to say, hey, look, I'll take the under on this side of the play, and I'll take the long shot on that side of the play, where I'm getting much greater than even money odds. Right? Well, understand, promoters hedge. I know every fighter wants to believe that the promoter has targeted them because of their ability, that the promoter sees them as a future champion, right? That the promoter thinks they're special and wants them. Let's be clear here on Sander Martin, and Sander Martin is a mover. Sander Martin, an argument can be made, please revisit this fight. Martin is the architect on how to give Teofimo Lopez problems. You understand Teofimo Lopez is a cash cow. People come out for Lopez's fights, particularly in the New York area. Sander Martin, a southpaw, fights Teofimo Lopez. Knocks him down. Right? The announcers during the fight felt that Sander Martin was neck and neck with Teofimo Lopez in the fight. They announced Teofimo, coincidentally, the box office cow in the fight. <laughs> they announced Teofimo the winner of that fight. What does Top Rank do? Knowing that Teofimo is one of Top Rank's cash cows, they go out and they sign Sander Martin. Folks, we're not the only ones hedging. Promoters are hedging. They understand the way to protect Teofimo is by signing the guy who gave Teofimo the most trouble outside of George Cambosis. Right? Well, understand, top rank bid on the Devin haney Sander martin fight. They bid a low amount. Devin Haney's a bit upset because, of course, he got all this money, and it's a bonanza for him for the Ryan Garcia fight. And, of course, Haney, who's a boxing free agent, is upset that his good buddy, Eddie Hearn and Matchroom, didn't step in with some blockbuster bid for him against Sander Martin. Right, Devin Haney feels that top rank came in with a low bid in part because Devin got knocked down multiple times by Ryan Garcia. Devin Haney feels that the only reason he got knocked down by Ryan Garcia was because Ryan Garcia had Osterin in his system and was cutting corners. So now Devin Haney's talking about the possibility of suing Ryan Garcia. Now, fighters need to realize that life is unfair. Boxing is not a meritocracy. Why did Devin Haney get the financial bonanza that he did against Ryan Garcia? Well, it was because he was fighting Ryan Garcia. It's because the fans love Ryan Garcia. Garcia's picture should be in the dictionary next to Canelo's and Anthony Joshua's. Whoever has the title, Ryan Garcia is the cash cow part of the card. Right, just objectively. Devin Haney against Sander Martin, what are the blockbuster 
payday fights that Sander Martins had. Martins dangerous, make no mistake. Boxing purists like me are looking forward to the fight. Right? We understand that Devin Haney against Sander Martin is a highly competitive fight. But understand, boxing purists will typically look at fight cards and will be excited by a fight that's a non-headliner fight. A fight that might be the second or third fight on the card. That might not even have a sellout crowd. Right? So Devin Haney is kidding himself. He doesn't have the market power that Ryan Garcia has. I'm not saying that's the way it should be. I'm just saying that's the way it is. Eddie Hearn has to think about the fighters he has under contract first. Right? Eddie's argument is that he has a full dance card. Eddie also, because he has fighters under contract, has a contractual obligation to prioritize them. He can't show up at some purse bid on a Devin Haney fight and offer eight figures, particularly when the opponent is not Gervonta Davis, right? Another cash cow. The opponent's not Jaron Annis, who's now an Eddie Hearn fighter, who Eddie has a contract with. No, the opponent's a top-ranked guy. Also, understand, top ranks situation here. They have a contract with Sander Martin. So, of course, they're going to show up and they're going to bid on their fighter. And they're going to bid an amount that they feel they can make a profit on. They don't want to overpay for this fight. And, of course, the fight is an opportunity for Sander Martin to actually have a shot at a title. If you think Sander Martin is underrated now, imagine how much more underrated he'll be if he actually gets the title and people have to come to him. So I feel Devin, and I know this is going to sound hard. Look, life is hard. Right? Life is unfair. Life is hard. Devin Haney has to get over the fact that Ryan Garcia cheated against him. Now, when I say Ryan Garcia cheated, I'm just telling you my belief, right? I don't think Osterin magically jumps in your system, right? Let me just point out to Ashwagandha, I'm into health, I take supplements. Uh, I'm not a professional fighter, I'm not representing, you know, I'm not violating VADA rules or anything like that. But just understand, ashwagandha is a long-time supplement with a long-time history. Now, maybe the mainstream doesn't know about it, but the idea that Ryan Garcia is using one of uh, Holistic Medicine's best-known supplements and is throwing out the claim that somehow what he took had Oster in it is in, in it, it's simply ridiculous. Right, folks? It, it's ridiculous. I get the feeling he just picked a holistic medicine with a big name, ashwagandha, for distraction purposes, and then tried to claim that the sample he took was tainted. As I've said here for a long time online, all of these juicers have the cover story figured out before they get busted for the crime. Right? This is like the person who hires a hitman to kill a rival and then make sure that they're in Walmart at the time the murder takes place. So the cops start talking to him. Right? This is like an episode of Dateline. The cops say, hey, you know, where were you, before the cop even says, where were you at 2 o'clock on Saturday when Joe Brown got killed, the suspect says, I was in a Walmart. Here's my receipt. Right? Here's the parking space where I was in, across from the security camera. Right? That's what Ryan Garcia is trying to do here. If I'm Devin Haney, I move on from it. I made a boatload of money 
off the fight, I'm no longer with a defeat. I'm still unbeaten. There are a lot of guys at 140, including a couple I've named here, Isaac Cruz, Raleigh Romero. There are a lot of guys at 140 that I can fight against, right? The Sander Martin fight, based on the purse, I'm getting seven figures. What am I complaining about? How many guys in this sport get seven figures ever for any fight? If I'm Devin Haney, I move on from Ryan Garcia, right? Understand, if Garcia shows up at press conferences and says, hey, let's do it again, there's a huge part of the boxing public that's going to fully understand if Devin Haney says, no, we're not going to do it again. You cheated the first time. I'm not going to give you another purse. More importantly, because this is a Machiavellian world, while I myself think Ryan Garcia cut corners, I'm entitled to my own opinion. I'm not saying he did. I'm saying I think he did. I do believe Devin Haney loses the lawsuit against Ryan Garcia were he to file one. Right? First, let's understand in the real world, Ryan Garcia is a multimillionaire. Right? He can hire great lawyers. He can hire great experts. Right? Let me just point out, I had a divorce case where um, we paid a lot of money for a forensic accountant. Right? There's a part in the case where the judge got tired of the attorneys questioning the guy and she decided to question the guy himself, uh, herself, right? Female judge. And of course, the forensic accountant and her had a history. I'm not making this up, right? I had hired the guy. The guy was expensive. The guy was worth every penny, right? We walked out of there. It was a case where there was a prenup, right? <laughs> you know, pretty, pretty tough prenup. We got out of there with hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? With the prenup because of the arguments that our forensic accountant made. Needless to say, I've had this guy at multiple trials, right? Just to understand, experts can do a lot. That divorce case was a bench trial. Right? The judge was the one who decides things. Now here, understand Ryan Garcia can hire great experts, a great team of attorneys. Understand Ryan Garcia has always maintained that the supplement he took was tainted. You can imagine there are some tainted supplements on the market. Right, I'm not saying as many as these busted boxers claim. But there are some tainted supplements on the market. You know, Ryan Garcia has surrounded himself with some of the best in boxing. So you can imagine he can have people like Derek James on the stand. Say, look, at no time did Ryan and I talk about any supplements. Right? I have absolutely no knowledge of Ryan taking any supplements whatsoever. Um... You know, just understand, um, it matters because you might have fight fans in the jury who are dazzled by the celebrity of the people around Ryan Garcia. Understand, too, that the burden of proof would rest with the plaintiff, Devin Haney, who no doubt would have his own experts but wouldn't have definitive proof other than the test results that Ryan Garcia had Osterin in his system, right? So if I'm Devin Haney, I don't sue Ryan Garcia. Why keep this in the news? What you want to do is spend your money on yourself, keep your name in the news by continuing your career and beating credible opponents. You know, when we think about upcoming fights and what have you, you know, we think about the guys who are on hot streaks in winning fights, not guys who are on hot streaks in winning lawsuits. If I'm Devin Haney, I let this go. Understand, too, 
when you're dealing with a cash cow fighter. You don't want to alienate that fighter's fan base. Right? You don't want Ryan Garcia fans to suddenly say, hey man, this is messed up. Right? He's coming after our guy. I can tell you there was a time where I would make a video here online. It would be about two other fighters and I would just mention Anthony Joshua to make a point. And the first few comments that came in weren't about fighter A or fighter B. It was from Joshua fans who would say, why are you saying this about Anthony Joshua? And there'd be several of, of the messages. Right? That's when I started to understand this young guy in the UK is a cash cow. Right? You don't want the Ryan Garcia fans viewing you as the person who's trying to end Ryan Garcia's career. Let me also say a few things. It's June the 22nd. You know how boxing works. If fighters agree today to fight each other, that fight's not going to take place until November, December, right? Because the fighters want to organize their camps. The promoters want them to take a tour of, you know, press heavy areas where the press can ask the fighters about each other and stuff like that. Uh, the promoters want the fighters to sit down with journalists and talk about their strategies, talk about past fights. So you understand that if a fighter signed today, that fight's not going to take place for several months, right? Ryan Garcia's year-long suspension goes back to April. In other words, the suspension is basically giving Ryan Garcia one fight off, right? That's the cycle. They could have suspended him for longer. It's only a year-long suspension. <laughs> So, of course, all that really means is that Ryan Garcia, in addition to losing his base purse, in addition to having this violation on his record, so, of course, if he is found with a designer PED that's illegal in his system again, would probably face more problems, right? A longer suspension. This is basically a one-fight-off suspension of Ryan Garcia. Now, for the folks out there into economics, understand, absence can make the heart grow fonder, right? If Ryan Garcia reappears for a fight a year from now, right? And the way he would do it is, of course, he would wait until early next year and then say, hey, I'm going to fight fill in the blank, Jaron Ennis, right? Some big fight, because understand, rightly or wrongly, not that Ryan Garcia has earned any seating at 147. But rightly or wrongly, he's the person the fans want to see. <laughs> right? So cash cow fighters jump the line. Right? Think about it. Tyson Fury loses his title by one point on the third judge's card. And there's a sanctioning body out there that has leapfrogged. Think about it. Leapfrog, Anthony Joshua, over Tyson Fury. Joshua's last two opponents were Otto Wallen, who Fury has beaten already, and Francis Ngannou, who Fury has beaten already. This is a loaded heavyweight division. I can tell you, Wallen and Ngannou aren't the two uh, fighters I think of when I think of the best fighters out there at heavyweight right now, right? Just to put things in perspective, understand Joe Parker's last two victories were over Deontay Wilder and Zhili Zhang. Somehow Joshua, according to one sanctioning body, has leapfrogged Tyson Fury, who, of course, lost by one point to a fighter who has beaten Joshua twice. Folks, you need to understand, when you're a cash cow fighter, you get special consideration, right? If Ryan Garcia announces that 
his next fight is going to be against Jaron Ennis a year from now. Folks, he's going to make a mint. That's after an Osterin suspension. Right? Devin Haney needs to come to the harsh realization that he's just not as loved as Ryan Garcia is. Right? That's reality. We can pretend there's some other world going on out there. Right? That's reality. Understand, you get to a trial and you might have, you know, Ryan Garcia dazzling, dazzling a jury with his star power. Right? An argument can be made that the best acting job O.J. Simpson ever did was in trying on his gloves, okay, my opinion, uh, was trying on the gloves in front of the jury. Right? I'm sure there were members of the jury looking at O.J. Keep in mind, O.J. went to college at USC. Right? Very high-profile football program in Southern California. Understand, this is a Southern California jury. Right? O.J., of course, at the time was in movies like The Naked Gun. So here you have an icon in Southern California, so much of one that O.J. carried the Olympic torch before the L.A. Olympics. Here you had that type of star power trying on gloves before a jury. You can imagine the jury looked at him, was blinded by the celebrity, saw that the gloves looked like they didn't fit his hands, and thought, if the gloves don't fit, you must acquit. Right? Could you imagine a Devin Haney, Ryan Garcia fight? Wasn't that fight in New York a sellout? Could you imagine Ryan Garcia in court? You know, doesn't even have to testify. Just has to sit there at the defense table and shake his head when there's any talk about him juicing. Right? All he has to do is just shake his head. Right? <laughs> Let's just say Devin needs to move on. Right? You, player, you're an unbeaten champion. There are challengers out there. Have at it. Those are my thoughts. Let me point out, too. Devin has another problem, and it's a causation problem. What caused the extra power in Ryan Garcia's punches? Was it Osterin, or was it Devin's decision? And this would be a big part of the trial to allow Ryan Garcia to come in three and a half pounds heavy, right? Three and a half pounds overweight, right? Folks, that doesn't happen in boxing. You know that if it were a cruiserweight fight and one guy tried to come in weighing 203 and a half, you and I know that would be viewed as egregious. Here you had a fight at 140, and a guy was allowed to come in at 143 and a half. If Devin Haney were to take the stand and were to say, I couldn't believe how hard this guy hit. Right? Well, we all know Ryan Garcia just knocked out Oscar Duarte. Ryan Garcia's left hook is lethal. We already know that. Right? There's something called comparative negligence. Was the punching power the result of Haney's willingness to go forward with the fight and receive a substantial payday? And it was substantial. Right? By looking the other way under three and a half pounds. Right? Did that cause the extra power? Wouldn't that at a minimum undercut Devin Haney's arguments? that the extra power was caused by the Osterin. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours. I hope you leave them in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.